All right, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Okay, so I, I really, my intention before the, before the break in that first session was not to, not really just to give a history lesson. It's, it's really to kind of bring you up to speed on why Romans 9 is problematic. Okay? And so uh, what I want to do the second half, so the first half we talked about Calvinism and why that has colored people's perspective when they read, for example, Romans chapter 9. Now what I want to do is I want to sort of break down Romans 9, if you will, on a timeline, at least part of it, and, and have a look at what it really is meaning here. And you'll see how far off base John Calvin was, to be quite honest with you. Um, so um, what you can kind of see, by the way, if you, if you study Romans chapter 9, so for example, if you come back to the early part of Romans chapter 9, verses 3 and 4 and 5, Paul talks about Abraham and Israelites, and then he talks about not everyone who is of Israel is Israel. And so it's funny, he kind of goes back to Israel's start, then, and so we kind of get an allusion to the Abrahamic covenant, then you get into Moses and Pharaoh, the Mosaic covenant, and then you get into this issue about... Um, uh, the wrath of God, and, and uh, that's Daniel's 70th week. And then you get into the stuff about hope for uh, our bringing Israel back around towards the end of the chapter. And so you get this broad view, really, of Israel's history. But Paul is using that to illustrate what God is doing for even Gentiles now, today, under the dispensation of the grace of God. Okay? And so let's look at this real quick on a, on a timeline. And, and this is sort of a way to sort of diagram part of Romans 9 here. And I think it, it, it helps us sort of get our mind around what's going on. Come to verse uh, 20. Romans chapter 9, verse 20. It says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Now, if you think back in the Bible, how did Israel become a nation, Israel? God formed it. Okay? Now, when we say God formed it, that started with coming to Abraham and initiating this covenant and then we get Isaac, the promised seed, right? And then uh, as we come on down, we get Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. Um, as you get on down, we get to Moses, for example, and we get the law. And the law, part, part of the law's intent was to take this group, this bloodline of people, and separate them from all peoples of the earth, okay? And to make them a holy nation, okay, a consecrated nation, one that is different from any other nation. So when, when we talk about forming, very literally, God molded the nation Israel, okay, in very much the same way that a potter molds a vessel. Now, we talked about this last week. Keep reading in verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor. Now, this passage here is not saying God made Israel dishonorable. Okay? But what, we've, what we have discovered and through our study and what we find out here is that in Israel's past, in their history... Let me, let me give you a, a point of reference here in our timeline. Here's, here's Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. In time past, we find out that Israel was a vessel of dishonor. How so? How was Israel dishonorable? <laughs> In every possible way. Uh, through their rejection of God. Okay? Through their rejection and distrust of His Word and His commands. Through their behaviors. I mean, we think about, for example, Moses when he was up on Mount Sinai and all of a sudden he looks back and what's going on down at the base of the mountain? They're creating a golden calf to worship. We were just having this conversation in the break. Uh, Jen and I were talking about this, this religion known as Scientology and how it is that people can just like blindly go for this stuff. And I think the same thing with Israel. I'm like, literally, this man is on the mountain talking to God. And you determine you need not that God. Like, 
I just don't get it. But anyway, so Israel is the vessel of dishonor. Now, speaking of potter and clay, this whole analogy, we've got to kind of go back and get some Old Testament context here to understand. So hold your place here in Romans 9 and go back with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. Look with me starting in verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 18, starting in verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. What does the potter do when he sits down at the wheel? He takes a lump of clay and he starts to form it, right? Okay. Now, look what it says in verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was what? Marred by his hands? Marred in his hands. It wasn't that the potter had a lack of skill or that he marred it. It's that the clay itself was marred. It had a problem. Okay? It became a vessel of dishonor. Now, and we've talked about this when we talk about when we talk about Pharaoh's hardening. Who's responsible for Pharaoh's hardening? Pharaoh had already rejected God, and so when God had exposed him to his word and his wonders, what did Pharaoh do? He doubled down on his position. He hardened in his rejection. Rejection precedes hardening. Okay? The clay, Israel, was marred, and so the dishonor is a result of the rejection of God. Okay? And so... We see here, and the vessel that he made uh, of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Now when Jeremiah received this prophecy, what was this, what was this example supposed to point to or illustrate? It was supposed to illustrate the nation Israel and God's ability to reform her. Okay? God has had an intention all along for the nation Israel, for Israel to be the the crown jewel, right? And He wants a pure and a holy people. But she has been dishonorable. She has not been a vessel vessel that is is, uh, able to, to be worked through or usable, so to speak, okay? And so Israel has been this vessel of dishonor. So God found the clay marred in His hand. Now, um, the thing you've got to remember, this this issue of um, God remolding Israel started really when Jeremiah was prophesying here when they went into captivity to the Babylonians. God said time and time again, you need to obey me, you need to obey me, you need to obey me. And finally, He said, okay, you're not going to obey me. And so the consequences got worse and worse and worse because of the rejection. And so finally God said, I tell you what, Israel, I'm going to send you into exile and I'm going to put you under the control of Gentiles. And thus started the times of the Gentiles. That also began a process of reforming Israel. By reforming, I meant remolding and reshaping. Really shaping them into what God wanted to make them. Today, okay, Israel is still under Gentile control. They do not have a king from the line of David on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Okay? We are still in the times of the Gentiles. God is still trying to mold, remold, remake Israel to what He intended her to be. Y'all with me? Okay. So this started that process. And so, so God said, I'm going to do that. And so 
Uh, even though when we get into the dispensation of the grace of God down here in time, which is what we're in today, um, even though the dispensation of grace, uh, through the dispensation of grace, God is molding Israel. Y'all turn with me. Go Take a right turn and go back to Romans 11 real quick. Now, in time, in relationship to the cross here, you get out here past the Acts period, and now we're in the dispensation of the grace of God. And this is what I'm referring to. This is a time when God is not dealing directly with the nation Israel. Israel is not at the top of the hierarchy today. Okay, God is not dealing with Israel as a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, and all the other people of the earth are... are you know, submissive to them. That, that's not what he's doing today under the dispensation of grace of God. But just because he's not doing that does not mean he has forgotten his intention to remold and reshape Israel into that crown jewel that he's wanting. Um, so even this today is an effort. What God is doing with you and me today is part of a bigger picture here to bring Israel back around. Okay? Here's how I know that. Romans chapter 11, look at verse 11. Paul says, I say then, have they, that is Israel, stumbled that they should fall. In other words, be annihilated. And he says, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them, Israel, to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles... How much more their fullness. You see how there's a, a leaning and there's an intent to steer Israel. Right? Keep reading. It says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify in my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Okay? And so, uh, this, is a, this is a process, even today, this is part of a process to reform uh, Israel. Now, come back to Romans 9. So, you have this vessel of dishonor, Israel, okay? They've killed the prophets, they've rejected God. Now, the Savior, the Messiah comes along, and what do they do? They reject Him. They reject His Word and they kill Him. They kill the Son. So we've rejected the Father. We're rejecting the Son. Now, we get, I'm sorry, I told you all Romans 9. Go back to Acts chapter 7 for me. Acts chapter 7. Now what we're going to see is they're going to reject the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 7. And as a result, what you're going to see, this vessel of dishonor is about to become a vessel of wrath. Okay? And why is that? Let's look at Acts chapter 7 and come with me to... Uh, uh, come with me to verse 51. Now, y'all know the story. Stephen, he's on trial and he begins to testify against the rulers and the counselors of the nation Israel and their, their hard-heartedness and all this stuff. And he says in verse 51, he says, Ye stiff-necked, Acts 7 verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist whom? The Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw what? What does the Scripture say here? The glory of God. So this is the first part of it. So they have rejected God the Father. They've rejected the Son. Now they're going to deny and reject the Holy Spirit through, the, through, the, uh, through Stephen. Okay? And as they do, Stephen looks up and he sees the glory of God. 
Now, one of the things you've got to understand, the glory of God is synonymous with a lot of things, but one of the things it's synonymous with is His power, but even His fury. Okay? And for a little reference here, y'all turn with, hold your place there in Acts 7 and go with me to uh, Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15. And in, just to give you some quick context, in Revelation chapter 15, the whole book of Revelation is regarding the tribulation period on the earth. And, and during the tribulation period on earth, God is going to pour out His wrath on the entire world. Okay? Now, in the midst of that, uh, watch what it says. Uh, Revelation 15, verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from what? The glory of God and from His power. And so, man was able to enter, uh, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So, come back to Acts chapter 7. When Stephen looks up into heaven and he sees the glory of God as Israel is rejecting the Holy Ghost, do you think this is a good glory? Or do you think this is a, uh uh-oh, we done messed up, glory. Okay? This is a, it's a tremor. Okay? This is a revelation of the very power of God. And for what reason now? His people, who have no reason to, have rejected Him for ages. And it's been building and building. And then it goes on and he says... Not only did he see the glory of God, but now he says, and he sees Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, for this, watch this. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew, hold your place there in Acts 7 and go to Matthew chapter 22. Now, when we come back to Matthew 22, we're right here before the death of Jesus. Jesus is teaching and He's speaking to the Pharisees. And, uh, and, and he, he mentions something here that I think is really important for us to catch. Verse 44. He's quoting David. And in verse 44, He says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until what? Okay, until I make thine enemies my my footstool. When Jesus died, was buried and resurrected, then He ascended to heaven. According to that verse, what was He to do when He got to heaven? Sit. Until what? Until the enemies of God... We're prepped. <laughs> I'll say it that way. Okay? So at the ascension, when he comes to heaven, he's to sit at the right hand of God while business is handled. Well, then as we move forward, just in a little bit of time, here we have Stephen full of the Holy Ghost and Israel denying everything that the Holy Ghost is trying to, to say to them. So they reject him. At that point, God's enemies are super-duper clear. And who are they? Israel. So now, is Jesus sitting? What does Acts chapter 7 tell us in verse 55? He's what? That means His enemies are now about to be His footstool. Okay, now pause. Let's think about this. We don't know anything about Paul's ministry yet. Okay, that hasn't happened on the earth. So all of this is happening according to prophecy, right? What is supposed to happen now as the Lord Almighty stands, okay, at the right hand of God and the glory of God is starting to boil over? What is supposed to happen according to prophecy? Well, let's look at it. Go with me to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Let's start reading in verse 1. 
Why do the heathen rage? That's Gentiles. And the people, that's Israel, imagine a vain thing. What he's talking about here and referring to in prophecy is the crucifixion of the Lord, of the Messiah. Okay? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers, that is the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the rulers take counsel together. Now, that's exactly what happened. Y'all remember? Now, this psalm right here was written years and years and years and years and years and years before Pilate and the Jewish rulers took counsel together. This is amazing to me. And it happened just like the prophet said it would happen. So that's what happened. And it says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then what? Okay, so after they kill the Messiah, He's ascended, He sits. Then they reject the Holy Spirit. They are now in derision. Now what is supposed to happen? Look at verse 5. Then shall He speak unto them in His what? Wrath. Israel is about to become a vessel of wrath. Okay? And vex them in His sore displeasure. So what is the next event that's supposed to happen after this derision? Remember, we ignore right now the dispensation of the grace of God because it's hid. So what do we get next? Tribulation, or according, well, I'll put a T there for tribulation, but according to prophecy, it's uh, Daniel's 70th week. Okay? The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Tribulation. That's what's supposed to happen according to tribulation. I mean, according to prophecy. And then he keeps on going. Verse 6, so what's supposed to happen to happen? What is supposed to happen after that? I can't talk today. Verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. What is that in reference to? After the tribulation, what? The kingdom. Okay? My king on my holy hill, Zion. Where is Jesus going to come to? And where is He going to rule the world from? Jerusalem. Okay? He says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. See, that's Israel's salvation, her kingdom. Okay? They're going to be a kingdom of priests ruling the world. Um, verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord of fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and ye perish from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. So this vessel of dishonor has now been made a vessel of wrath. This is all in, in accordance with the uh, prophetic timeline, if you will. Okay. Now, come back with me to Romans 9. I jumped ahead of myself a second ago. Romans 9. So this is the context. What we just sort of quickly like sped through this timeline real quick. This is the backdrop in the context. The illustration that sort of Paul is painting to explain to those who would object to what God has done to Israel today. Today, under the dispensation of the grace of God, Israel is accursed. She's on pause. The whole program was put on pause. Okay. Now look what he says in verse 22. What if God, willing to show His wrath... When was He willing to show His wrath? Right there. Jesus was standing, remember? Okay. What if God, willing to show His wrath and make His power known... At that time, He was willing to do it. Okay. Uh, to make His power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 9, he's speaking to Gentiles and he's saying, hey guys, um, understand what's happening here. At this point in time, God was willing to go ahead and start pouring out His wrath. But instead, you know what He's doing? 
He has opened a period of time, a long-suffering time, okay, so that He can do something else. He's holding off. That was like mind-blowing. It was totally unknown. Totally unknown in, in history. And so, that's what happened. Now, why did He do it? Well, look at verse 23. That He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy which He had afore prepared unto glory. So, guess what we get here? You and me. Vessels of mercy intended to mold and reshape Israel to prepare her for what God had promised her. They didn't see that. Okay? And Paul is trying to illustrate here, listen, the reason why God right now is holding off His wrath is so that He can show mercy, so that He can take these then and come back and show them mercy as well. He's trying to reshape them, remold them. And so that's exactly what he's up to. He's showing uh, mercy. He, verse 23, "...in that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory." That last phrase there, "...which he had afore prepared unto glory." Let's talk about that real quick. Hold your place there in Romans 9 and go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Again... Be careful that you don't read into this some stupid Calvinistic doctrine. In any of this, have you seen any Calvinistic doctrine? None of it. Okay? Now, this idea right here of God showing mercy to Gentiles, did God just suddenly right here go, well, since they rejected me, I don't know. I'm, I kind of want to hold off on pouring out my wrath. Now that I've seen what they've done, I want to hold off. Is that what he did? That's not what the Scripture indicates. God was not caught off guard by this. God was not unknowing here. Because what the Scriptures tell us is in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, He had this mystery thing, this mystery purpose in mind. Look what it says in Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, Gentiles, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Look at this, verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him, when? Remember, we've talked about this when we did our study of Ephesians. Before the foundation of the world, God wasn't choosing the children to be saved. He was choosing the channel through which He would save. Notice He says there, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Uh, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. What an incredible thing that He, he has revealed now. But this was something that was in the mind of God before the world began. Okay? Again, this wasn't something where He was caught off guard. Okay? Um, now, come back to, to Romans 9. Again, what I want you to see is Romans 9 is really sort of laying out this timeline, if you will, and helping to illustrate just in, in big picture format what exactly God is up to. Uh, Romans 9. So, we have these vessels of mercy now. That's you and me. And this is, sort of, this is the dispensation of the grace of God. A new policy system, okay? We're not under law anymore, we're under grace. It's not the kingdom program, this is the grace program, okay? Now, Romans 9, uh, come with me to... Um, uh, where am I at? Uh, 24. Even us whom He hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, we are these vessels of mercy. Now, look at... Uh, come on down to verse 28. For He will finish uh, the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make 
upon the earth. And Isaiah, as uh, uh, Isaiah said before, except the Lord of uh, Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. What he's talking about here, and just sort of cutting to the chase, is the tribulation period here. This short work that he's going to do on the earth. Okay, And what he's talking about there, he's going to cut it short. He's, he's saying, listen, this is going to be so severe that if he didn't bring it to an end, nobody would be left. Okay, But he has a purpose in mind on what he's trying to do. He is, again, he is trying to remold Israel and prepare uh, Israel for their kingdom promise. And so verses 28-29 are laying out that uh, 70th week of Daniel, that tribulation period. Uh, come back with me now to verse 25. And then we get this last part. I'll do this in green just so I'm using all of the colors. Um, <laughs> verse 25. Um, As he saith also in uh, O.C. or Hosea, I, I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not beloved. Now, a lot of times people look at that and they read into it and think that he's talking about Gentiles there. He's not. He's talking about Israel. Okay? Talking about Israel. This vessel of dishonor. She was not beloved. She had disobeyed and rejected God. But through this process of time and molding and reshaping the marred clay, He's making a vessel of what? A vessel of honor. Okay? And we'll see that in the kingdom. Israel to her kingdom promise. And it says, As he saith also in Hosea, I, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel. Notice that? Concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. In the same way, through time, through His Word, God has been isolating a remnant of faithful Israel out of the larger population of biological Israel. He's still doing that so that when we come to the kingdom, that remnant will be there. Okay? Even today, He's doing that. Now, I, know that, I, knew that would, I knew that would bring up a question. <laughs> Are they what now? <laughs> That's a good question. My understanding is if they are saved under the gospel of Christ, under the dispensation of the grace of God, they are part of the body of Christ because today there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Now, what you're going to have right here going into the kingdom, you will have another resurrection. Okay? Who will be resurrected to go into that kingdom? Okay? You will have believers from this point backward. Okay? I say this point, but those saved under the kingdom gospel as well as those saved in the tribulation period. I believe Jews, who happen to be Jewish by ethnicity, okay, um, that, are, that trust in the gospel of Christ for their salvation, I believe they are made a part of the body of Christ, where there's neither Jew nor Gentile. That distinction is meaningless. Okay? Now, that gets really hairy, because you have this Acts period that's like here. <laughs> it's not so much a line, it's like a square. <laughs> if you really zoomed in on that line, it has thickness <laughs> because it extends in time, right? And in that Acts period, you, you had sort of multiple streams. One was closing out and one was opening up, right? And so, um, but it has to do with, the best way I know how to explain it at this point is un under which program were you initiated? Okay, and then which program were you consummated under, so to speak? Because, for example, Acts chapter 19, Paul came upon some disciples of John who had been baptized in John's baptism, but they had not yet about the uh, heard about the coming of the Holy Spirit. So Paul lays hands on them. Now, we're already in the dispensation of the grace of God, but they had been initiated under the kingdom program. The only difference is yet they didn't know anything about the ministry of the Holy Spirit at that time. We're still early in Paul's ministry. The miraculous sign gifts are still in activation for various reasons. So Paul lays hands on them because that's their right. And, and there is a, if you, for lack of a better word, there's a consummation there. Okay? And so I know that gets sticky in that Acts period, but nonetheless, um, that's what you got. So... The broad point I'm trying to show here in Romans 9 
It has nothing to do with God choosing to save some and condemning others. On its face, when you read those verses, I can understand why it would make you uncomfortable. But when you stop and you study the Scriptures and you rightly divide the Word of Truth, you realize it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with this grand plan that God has, His will for not only Israel, but also for Gentiles as well, for all the peoples of the earth. And so come with me to Romans 11. And again, we'll close with this. And we've read this multiple times. But I think it's, it's worth uh, reading again. Romans 11, uh, verse 26 is where we'll start. And so, all Israel shall be saved. Okay, As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer. Now, when he says all Israel there, you've got to keep in context what Israel he's talking about. Okay, Does he mean all biological Israel? He can't. Because all biological Israel did not believe. Okay? And if you go back to chapter 9 there, the beginning of the chapter, he says, not all those who are of Israel are Israel. Okay? So again, you have to keep in context here. So he says, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Uh, he's speaking there of the new covenant, which is regarding Israel's promise out here, not for us today. As concerning the gospel, that is the gospel of Christ, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. In other words, God's not going to... He's not going to suddenly stop carrying out His promise, even though right now it seems like He has. That's what Peter addresses in 2 Peter chapter 2, when he says God is, uh, is not slack concerning His promises, but is long-suffering to them uh, which have believed. He's addressing Jews. Peter's addressing Jesus and saying, Hey, listen, I know it seems like this is dragging on, dragging on, and you're never going to get your promise, but just understand the reason why it's dragging on right now is because God is dealing with Gentiles. Okay? And he goes on, uh, verse 30, For as ye in times past, ye, ye Jews in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their, un I mean, yeah, through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. So you see what God's doing right now? He's pouring mercy on Gentiles. He's trying to get them to turn and be jealous so that they will want to turn as well. And so that way God will bring them all in. All right? He's not just one track. Um, he goes on in uh, verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that He might have mercy upon all. Verse 33, and what a fitting conclusion. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been His counselor, or who hath first given to Him, and it shall be recompensed unto Him again. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Okay? And, and I do think that's a fitting doxology or praise of God. Because, I mean, when you start laying it out like this, you go... Golly, this dude has it together. <laughs> he's, he's very well organized and, and has, a, has a plan. And so, um, even though historically it doesn't look like God is dealing with Israel, either, He's written them off. And by the way, those of the Calvinistic persuasion, many of them, not all, but many of them will try to persuade you that God has written off Israel in its former glory and replaced her with us. Okay? And that is not a proper interpretation of the Scripture. That is a means to tr try to prove and drive a point. It's a polemic. Okay? So, anyway. Questions? Thoughts? Did I confuse you enough? So, again, when you get down into Romans chapter 9 and you start reading this for yourself, on the surface, some of these things can be problematic and it can sound very Calvinistic, but just know that is not at all what's going on. What's going on here is a dispensational thing. God is up to something broad and grand. Okay? And it has to do with His people Israel, but it also has to do with us, His vessels of mercy. To